Hello everyone. Hi, thanks for coming to our panel. We know it's cold outside and dark and you had to go outside of the building, so thank you for joining us. Uh-huh. You can come you, you don't can have come to. closer, I think, but <laughs> you maybe can everyone come closer. If you to your like. comfort level, of course. Your choice. Your, your choice. Normally there's like slightly more people here, but that's okay. We are mad. She's gonna sit. Anyway, we'll, oh, great. <laughs> we'll start by introducing ourselves. So my name is Jess. I'm Arden. And I'm Meredith. We, Arden and I have both previously worked as uh, game gurus, which is basically just people would pay us to teach other people board games. So we've done that quite a few times and we have really nailed our craft in teaching other people how to play games and want to share that with everyone else. Because oftentimes for folks who are trying to teach their friends how to play board games, you wind up having this experience. You know, you're like 25 minutes into explaining a game that takes 35 minutes to explain and you've said this is gonna be fun eventually, <laughs> like seven times, and at that point, it's not, it's just not gonna be fun if you had to say that it was gonna be fun that many times. No. Um, so we wanna help you avoid that. Exactly. So the most important option that you need to take in order to teach people how to play board games before you start even picking a board game that you're going to play is to know the people that you are going to play board games with. We generally assume that you folks here are board game people. Why else would you have come out in the cold <laughs> to come to this panel to help share your love of board games with other people? If the other people that you're going to play board games with are also, like us, nerds who play board games, then it's okay to think about playing a heavier game like Terra Mystica, sitting, getting some lunatics to play Twilight Imperium with you. Um, and it's really accessible to think about using board game terminology with those kind of people. You can get your friends together and say, are you feeling like a drafting game? Do you wanna do something with worker placement? Are you feeling more rules light or heavy? What about Euro versus American? If I went to my mom's house and I said, mom, do you wanna play a worker placement game with me? She would say, I have no idea what you're talking about, please go home. Um, so it's not helpful to use games, uh, use words in that way to think about games with people who don't play games. So instead, um, the way that I like to kind of approach playing board games with non-board gaming people is, what broad categories of games do I think my group might enjoy? Do I have a group of people who are really cutthroat and enjoy playing games with a winner at the end? Or do I have friends who are going to feel very overwhelmed by a game that's an hour long and they're gonna lose? In those instances, right, that's a group that I might just knock out all of my non-co-op games for. Do I think that this is a group of people who are patient and willing to sit and learn for a while? Or are they children or <laughs> drunk or not interested in doing those things? Okay. At which point I might pick a short or a more rules-like game and do I think that folks are willing to have the kind of delayed gratification that it takes to learn a longer and more complicated game? Or do they need something that I can get them to start playing within 10 minutes of putting the box on the table? So this kind of like decision-making flow chart that you can use for picking your game based on the audience of friends or family that you wanna play games with can really help to, before you even sit down to think about how to teach the game, having a successful game experience with those folks that you want to game with. That for a second. Um, and to just go off of that as well, knowing your audience can help you, if you've already chosen a board game to teach, can help you teach it more effectively. So that same terminology that you said earlier, like whatever, hand management, worker placement, or whatever. If I have a game I want to play, I can cut through a bunch of the rules by just saying to my board game literate friends, it's a worker placement game with hand management in it. Here we go. As opposed to, again, the prototypical, my mom. If I said, all right, we're gonna play a game, it's like Seven Wonders, but here are some exceptions. She doesn't, that doesn't mean what that means. Yeah. So. Okay, on. Um, the next thing is being prepared. So I 100% recommend that you read the rule book before you start. And I don't mean get everyone to your house and then open up the rule book, because that is going to be a bad time. So fully read through the rule book before you have people sitting at your table and like rushing you to get the game started. Um, you can also uh, like read it multiple times if you need. Um, and if you're having trouble picking it up from the rules alone, I love tutorial videos. If you go to YouTube, you can absolutely find most board games being taught, but still do read the rule book on top of that because not only will there be things that the video may not have taught you, 
but getting um, like understanding how the rule book is set up can help you answer questions on the fly because you'll like know where this information is and know how to find it better. Um, when you're learning the game, like anticipate common questions. When you're reading the rule book, what did you have trouble understanding? What can you put in your back pocket to explain better? Um, and then like know how many players it needs maybe before you invite people over. That's always helpful. Nothing sucks more than like wanting to play a specific game, inviting seven people over and it only plays six people. Like there's nothing else you can do there. Yeah, and it's also really, especially if you're learning a game from just the printed rule book, it can be helpful to like think through what order you might communicate some of the information in the rule book, which we'll talk about in just a second. Because if I read a 10 page rule book and I explain it by reading the rule book aloud, even if I understand the rules, that's usually like a pretty boring and unhelpful way to explain the rules of the game for your folks who are new and trying to figure out how the game works. So that's not usually the most logical structure of information that you can communicate the content of the rule book in. Generally the way we like to think about the order of operations of explaining a game is if any of you are journalism folks or have done any sort of informative writing in this way is the inverted pyramid or the inverted triangle where you want to provide information as it becomes relevant and not before. So we like to think of it in the sense of giving an elevator pitch about what the game is about, especially for games that are flavor heavy, right? You can say, we're gonna play code names. We are two teams of spies trying to identify which of the people at a party or at a group are our secret agents and not finding the enemy secret agents. We're trying to like figure out who are our spies and who are enemies. That's a fun way to get people to explain code names before you're talking about the fact that we're giving clues with numbers and words about how to explain which of these secret agents are our secret agents, right? So we give that elevator pitch with the flavor. Then we might explain some, some more specific information about what the turn looks like and everything like that. But we don't want to explain the minutia of the rules before we explain what's interesting about the game and what's fun for the players. Uh, the next, what, okay, this is like my favorite hack about teaching board games is to, um, like you need your, players to be focused on you and to be attentive to pl like playing the game. And I don't know about you, but if you want me to listen to you and not do anything else, I'm gone, like I'm somewhere else. My brain has already checked out. I'm very sorry. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to involve your players in the setup of the game. Um, I like to ha ask people to help me sort tokens or to choose what color they want to be or to shuffle cards that may or may not need to be shuffled. Like uh, just getting people invested in the game before it even starts can help people feel like part of it and focus a little bit better. And also not be on their phone. Also not be on their phone is important. We were playing, I think, code names maybe a week or two ago, and we had one friend who really wanted to learn, but just like kept touching stuff, and so he would just shuffled the cards while I taught. They didn't need to be shuffled. We didn't use the cards. I pulled them right back in the box. But it's a, it's a tactile, it's like giving them a fidget spinner, <laughs> but it's, it's involved in the game instead of thinking about something else. So, when it comes to, right, we've, we've picked the game that we want to play with this group, we've figured out something for the players to do while we're teaching that's keeping them invested in the experience. Now, what's the process, the actual tangible process we're going to use to explain this game? So, um, I don't know if any of you are tabletop players. Again, I assume a lot of people at MAGFest play tabletop games, but we often like to have a very brief kind of session zero experience, which is a couple of sentences of, we're going to be teaching you how to play a board game, Please, if you can, save your questions until the end. I do need you to focus on what we're gonna be explaining to you with the board game. If you already know how to play, hold on to your comments until the end because we might get to your comments or your questions before we're finished with the explanation. If you're really, really confused, raise your hand and we'll, we'll go back a step or whatever if you have no idea what's going on. But otherwise, whatever question you might have might come up later in the explanation. That makes sure that everybody knows that the more they focus on learning how to play the board game, the faster you're gonna actually play. Right, then we'll give that kind of elevator pitch. This is a game where we are trying to identify different birds and you're gonna have different habitats of birds um, and you're gonna be looking at birds and, and categorize them um, and you, you also get these fun components that look like little Jordan almonds. 
um, which is my favorite part about wingspan. Um, so then we, I might go through and say, all right, here are the different zones on the board, right? You're looking at this board, it's got lots of information on it for something like wingspan. It's, it's very like visually overwhelming to people who've never played the game before. So you explain, this is my zone, this is your zone on the board, this is your zone, here's our common areas, and here's kind of what they mean. Might start explaining to them what the different components are, right? So these are different eggs, and you're gonna be collecting different birds that are gonna be nesting in your territory. These are different foods that your birds need to eat in order to score you points. I might explain at this point too some of the iconography that's on the cards and on the board, right? So you'll see these feathers that are on different cards and on different elements of the board. Each of those places that you see feathers on the board is gonna represent points, right? So I'm going through and I'm explaining what the players can see and what the different pieces on the board that they can touch and interact with are gonna do for them as a player, right? So that they kind of, before we start talking about how to actually take a turn, they're kind of learning how to read the things that are happening on the board that they can see, the things that they can pick up and that they can touch, the pieces that are gonna change from turn to turn as different rounds go through. I also like to focus on what things players have control over so that people know what things they can touch while they're playing as opposed to what things are just gonna to happen to them that they're gonna interact with. Then I might explain at a very high level how the win is gonna go. If it's either a competitive or a co-op game, right? What's the win condition? What's your goal? I won't go into the detail, the specifics of, all right, and when we get to point scoring, here's all the point scoring elements that we're gonna go through in order, here's how we do all the math. But we wanna make sure that the players know what they're going for so that you don't get to the end of a really long game like Scythe and you didn't really quite understand how to win, so you spent the entire game not doing anything productive or not trying to reach your goals as a player and then you get you know, five points and somebody else gets 100 points and you feel like an idiot. What we wanna make sure that your players do is not come out of a game feeling like an idiot because then they won't come back and play games with you anymore. That's usually pretty sad. So, like I said, you'll explain the scoring in detail when it's appropriate. So for a really Euro type game where you have no idea who's gonna win until the end, I wanna explain, like Seven Wonders, right? Pretty accessible game for those of us who play board games. But when I'm explaining to somebody how to play Seven Wonders, I wanna give them an overview of what types of things will score them points. Like for Science and Seven Wonders, if you've played, I wanna explain that both having a lot of each category is important and having a lot of full sets is important, right? So you get multipliers for sets and the number of compasses you have is valuable to you. But they don't need to know the math of, or the ratio of how many bonus points you get per set necessarily, just that it's important for you to do those things. Military scoring, you get more points per round, but you don't need to go into detail for the math. So then, right, we, we understand what we're looking at on the board, we understand what we're trying to accomplish as a player at the table, then we're gonna walk through a demo turn, right, of all of the phases that are gonna happen in a turn. Say we're sitting down to play Pandemic, which, Maybe we haven't been putting on the table as much lately because it's kind of sad, but we're sitting down to play Pandemic. I say, all right, it's my turn. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my four actions. Here's what all of my actions are that I can do during my action phase so that somebody understands how they work. Then I'm gonna draw my cards from my hand and then I'm gonna do my epidemic actions, my, my infect and my intensify steps if they come up. I will only explain those actions as they become relevant, right? So during my explanation of the player action turn in Pandemic, I won't explain exactly how the Epidemic phase works because we haven't even seen the card yet. The players don't understand that. But I will go through and I'll say, all right, if I want to take a charter flight, here's how I take a charter flight in Pandemic. If I want to take a direct flight, I'll explain how I can do all of these actions. And I want to explain that, all of the different actions that I can take, and then I want to show the players an actual demo turn, right? I set up a demo board, especially for longer games, and I actually take the full turn and I explain all of my actions, I narrate them as I'm doing them, so that the players can actually see how those actions are gonna play out based on what cards I have in my hand and what the state on the board is. Because oftentimes people can get kind of overwhelmed when you say, all right, now it's your turn. You don't know how the turn really goes, I explained it verbally, but you didn't get to see it. So that can be really helpful for them to actually tangibly get to experience by watching me how that demo turn is gonna go. So now I've explained everything that's on the board, everything that the players need to know on how to win the game, they've seen how a turn is gonna go, then we're gonna give a recap, right, of all of the information. Especially again for more rules heavy games, 
it's good to then go back and give the like TLDR before we start playing it. Okay, so on your turn, you take an action, the board takes an action, there's a bad phase for the infection, and then it's somebody else's mm -hmm. turn. Here's what we're all trying to accomplish, right? As we've gone through all of these steps of getting more and more detailed about the game, I'm gonna go through some of those corner cases, right, of, of little edge cases in the rules, questions that everybody is going to wind up asking only when that information becomes relevant, right? So to go back to pandemic, I'm explaining how the flight actions work in pandemic. And I have my sample hand of seven cards from pandemic. And I say, all right, as one of my actions, I could take a direct flight to Cairo, because I have the card for Cairo in my hand. I can't use that card to fly to like San Salvador. I can't mm -hmm. fly to a city that's not the one that's on the card that I'm discarding. But I wouldn't explain that before I get to the point where I'm explaining that action on my player aid. And I wouldn't explain that after, right? I wanna explain it when I'm given that information that's gonna be relevant to the player so that when they think about taking that flight action, they know, ah, I was told, I can only take that flight action when I have it in my hand for that specific city. So now, right, we've, we've gone through all of that. This is the point where it's a great time for the players to start asking questions because we think that we've gone through all of the details that are gonna be important and helpful for the players. Now it's the point where they can digest all of that information that's in their head, mm -hmm. and then they can say, all right, you were explaining that point in Spyfall where we had like the, the timer stop. Can you explain again how that goes because I don't remember, or can I ask a question that's formatted in this way, mm -hmm. or we're playing code names, can I use a proper noun as my clue, right? Mm -hmm. They've had these questions. We didn't answer them when we were explaining. Sure. So now it's time that they can say, all right, here's a detail that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes those questions are a good opportunity for you to clarify something that you might not have explained as clearly as you could have. Or maybe your player just isn't quite understanding. But either way, it's a good opportunity then for the players to kind of prove to you that they've digested the information so that you can be kind of sure that they're gonna have a good time when they're playing. This is also a fine moment for other people who have played the game to then give some feedback about, here's something that I think that you missed that would have been important to you for explaining the rules of this game. Um, again, it's not great for that to come in the middle of your explanation because maybe the person who's sitting at the table with you didn't come to this panel. They're not a MAGFest this year, so they didn't hear this explanation of what we think is a good way to teach uh -huh. board games. So they're trying to go really deep into the minutia of the rules when you're at the start of the explanation, right? So now you can say, all right, this is a great moment for you to clarify that weird rule about homophones that comes up in, in code names or spy sure. games like that. Yeah. Um, so those are what, what we think the, the ideal steps are for kind of going through your explanation of how to play the game. And then you can actually sit down and start playing, right? Cool, yeah, yeah. Let's review those real quick, just because we laid a lot of stuff down at you all at once. Um, so the first thing that you would want to do is like do your quick elevator pitch, get someone excited about the game. Depending on the game, I will give like very different elevator pitches. So what is a good example? Um, like if it has a heavy storyline that I find interesting, maybe I explain it via that. If there is not really a heavy storyline, for example, this game Skull. I don't have, there's no storyline in this. It's just like a fun game that I'm pretty sure was invented at a bar using mainly coasters. Just something that can get people involved and excited about learning it. Um, then you would go into your intro, so you would explain all of the pieces that are in it, all of the like, um, all of the zones, all of the components, all of the stuff that um, you have ownership of. Like mm -hmm. each player has ownership of. Then you'd go into the gameplay about how you actually play. Finally, the win condition. Um, and this would be a time, so if you're not teaching like a, a smaller or easier game, um, we had mentioned previously maybe doing a demo turn. For heavier, larger games, I 100% recommend maybe you do like a demo round. Maybe you do a demo two rounds. I cannot tell you how disappointing it is when Arden and I were playing Scythe for the first time and she made a dumb decision at the beginning of the game <laughs> and she didn't figure it out until the three hours later when the game had ended and you lost miserably. I'm very sorry. Now have she I, won't play it with me anymore. Can I, have, I haven't played Scythe with anybody as yeah. it turns out <laughs> since then because I felt really dumb at the end because there was information about Scythe that I didn't understand but that I learned very quickly into the game. Mm -hmm. um, and then I felt sad because I'm not normally 
the winner of every board game, but I don't normally get absolutely trounced by everybody at the table other than me, so. A good thing to keep in mind, if you want to continue to have game nights with people, you want them to have fun. So sometimes that means restarting the game if someone made a bad mistake. Sometimes it means homebrewing some rules if you really truly don't enjoy what's going on or if there's like content in a game that someone is uncomfortable with. Or letting people revert an action when they didn't gain any information but they realized it was dumb, right? It can sometimes be hard to like let go of that urge to play the game right but if somebody says, ah, I actually meant on my last turn to have done this thing that doesn't impact anybody else at the table and I am not doing that in response to you, I just forgot. Yeah, you should, you should think you about should letting think them do about that. It. Don't, you don't, you have, don't have, to. have to do it, but you should think about it. Okay, cool. So one thing that we wanted to mention um, in light of the way the, the world. world is right now is um, virtual gaming. Um, and this is something that I'm sure that a lot of folks have tried out, but given that things continue to probably be um, a little more at home for, for at least a little bit at least. Um, we wanted to keep in mind that sometimes you have a, a very different game experience than sitting down at the table with folks and busting out the Innis board or busting out Ticket to Ride, right? So some people, and by some people I mean definitely me specifically, um, and Jess and a lot of other folks we know, have even more trouble paying attention virtually than they do in person because you are sitting in front of a magic internet machine that is full <laughs> of memes. All of the internet on it. TikTok is on there. You can go, no. you can go on Reddit. Reddit's on there. Yeah. Um, and so it's especially important for those gaming and social experiences to be fun and engaging and helping you stay connected with people um, when you can't see them in person. So I know that a lot of folks, um, your gaming experience, or at least my gaming experience with my friends, when we weren't playing strict video games, was playing Among Us or Jackbox, or those were the two. <laughs> and there were no other options. We didn't play anything else, which was so sad for me. Jackbox nights. Yeah. So um, many. So, um, and I know that Among Us and Jackbox might not seem like board games, but in a lot of ways, Among Us is just kind of like Mafia, but there's buttons you can press when you're playing Mafia, and Jackbox is like a lot of different lightweight party games, mm -hmm. um, like social deduction games, like um, spelling games and things like that. Um, so if you had a group that um, really used to like playing games like Secret Hitler or Resistance or One Night Ultimate Werewolf, and you, you haven't played Among Us, I know people don't play Among Us anymore, <laughs> but like, it's still fun, and you can play that kind of game. But if you had a group that people didn't pay attention or got really frustrated with each other and got really heated playing a game like Among Us, Maybe you sit down with that group who's never played D&D before and you try playing a, a session of D&D on Roll20. Um, or maybe you have a group who used to play tabletop games together in person and your DM, whose name is Arden, really struggles to run combat in Roll20 because she doesn't understand the interface for how to control any of the minis in Roll20. So you haven't played D&D in two years. Um, maybe you get into something like Tabletop Simulator where you can play real board games um, that people have loaded in components and rules for into Tabletop Simulator. It's important to, just like we, we talked about at the beginning, those kind of flowchart experiences that you can go through in your head um, for picking the games that you want to play with your group, looking at your shelf of board games. You can look at Steam, right? There's, and there's lots of board games, too, that exist on Steam. Um, like Ticket to Ride has a great virtual port and has for a long time that's very well supported. Um, so if you found that in the last two years your board game itch has not been scratched and you've tried some of those intro level options, I really strongly recommend that you give it another try. Mm -hmm. Take a look at what virtual game options are out there, but go to it with this type of logic of trying to think about the friends that you want to connect with and picking games that you think will engage them and have like let you all have fun in the same way that you're used to in person, just chilling out at home. Love it. So that's all we've got. Um, we're happy to take questions or teach you how to play Skull. <laughs> or, both. Or, both. or both. Or both. We can do two things, but we've prepared we'll do both. questions first. Yeah, so we'll do questions first, and then yeah. if we have time at the end, we'll teach Skull. Okay. Who wants to be the picker? Do you have any references to, like, I don't know, people think that they want to play this type of game? Who's going to be five as the option? I do not have that. 
Um, board board game, like, things like board, board game, game geek, geek have that. Yeah. So if you look for, if you look on the genre of like what's what part of this game is most interesting to your play group, is it the fact that it's less than an hour? Is it the player count? Is it the genre? So it's like a worker placement or a rules heavy or, or hidden identity or something. Hidden identity. Yeah. And then look for the top recommended games in that genre. And then you can say, you can try out some different options like that. So like I have been a big resistance fan for like 15 years. 10 years, um, and so when more games started coming out like that, mm -hmm. I realized the keyword for that is like social deduction, hidden identity games, and so now when I see a game that's advertised with that genre, that's just something that I'm really drawn to. And at what point, as a learner, can you get frustrated enough to tell the teachers to stop or to shift their own styles for you? I would say at any time. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, do you mean like you're not enjoying the board games that they're recommending, or? Oh, I would I would get to the point where you feel comfortable telling that person um, that this does not seem like a game for you before you start mm -hmm. or within the first few turns, right? Yeah. To just say, you know, we sat down to play. I, for, I forget if it was Spyfall or I think it was I Dark Overlord with a friend of ours, which is a bluffing and uh, improv game. It's mainly improv. Mainly I would say. improv, and we sat down to play with our friend, and within the first five minutes, he said, "Actually, I don't like this game." <laughs> And we said, cool, and we got another game, and we put another game on the table. So it's much better to, when you realize that you're getting frustrated like that, to just, to just step away for a second and say, hey, as we said, we're here to have fun. Let's find a more fun board game for me, personally. Right. Yeah. And I mean, for something like that, like, it's always a little nerve-wracking because you feel like you're going to end the fun for everybody else. But there are so many game options that can still connect with, like, the base, you know, genre or whatever, there is always going to be another answer that will still work for the greater party. So like, don't put your own comfort level or fun or whatever on the back burner because you think you're gonna end the entire thing for everybody because there's there's so many other options that's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And if you do have a friend group that will only play that one game, maybe that maybe we have board game night with other friends. Right? Yes. Maybe you become board game night host. Yes, and you pick. Mm -hmm. There you go. You guys kind of in your experience, uh, for or like more metric. Um, oh. Special power in the pandemic, but that's not too hard. Yeah. Like, Rude. Yeah. I have to use four different distinct board games while keeping everyone's attention, and that, that's That's hard. So I, um, I have a recommendation. Uh, I haven't used it to teach asymmetric games, but I think the concept still works. There's this large party game called Two Rooms and a Boom, where each play, like each card is an entirely different player and the play style is entirely different and you have a different win condition, lots of rules, and you can't, basically you can't clarify any of it because otherwise you, you, you can't play the game. You know, if people come up and ask you, what does this card do? It's like, well, I can't play this game anymore, but this is what it does. Um, so when I have those kind of parties, I will just send a YouTube link to the rules and allow everyone to learn it there first and then do just a super quick refresh and ask again, who didn't watch my YouTube video? And then yell at the people who didn't watch the YouTube video first. <laughs> they put a dollar in the swear jar. <laughs> and then allow them to read through the rule books. Um, I also leave, would make sure to leave the rule book out in like easier grab for everyone else mm -hmm. and allow them to look it up themselves. Cause you're right, you're, it'll take you four times as long to teach if you're trying to teach every specific play style. The other thing that I've had some success with in the past is when you have a game like Root or I don't know if any of y'all ever played Space Cadets, but Space Cadets is a co-op asymmetric game and, and in the middle of it, you will have to learn the other board games, right? So it's eight board games because you're on a spaceship and the bridge has eight stations and several times throughout you will be asked to switch to different stations. So not only is it asymmetric because there's a Yahtzee one, there's a shuffleboard one, there's a, mem a tile flipping memory one, um, but everybody has to know how all of them work. Or like Root is a game that um, is big and expensive and people want to play it more than once is to get a party of folks who are invested in playing that game more than once and then just say, hey, the first time we sit down to learn how to play this game, it's gonna take a while because everybody has to learn how to do all the things so that the next time we play Root, I don't have to be the roost every time because that's the only one that I know how to play or the Eerie, I forget what it's called, but I don't have to be birds every time. 
I can I play can I, I can beat birds every time, but I could play something else, right? So yeah. just telling folks like, it will be worth this one time where we spend a lot of the day learning how to play this one game because every other time we play, we won't have to do that again. Mm -hmm. So that can be helpful um, to kind of get people invested in almost a campaign-like play style for some of these bigger mm -hmm. um, asymmetric games. Do you see our favorite board games or recommended board games? Okay. Right, do, you go, do you want me to go first? Yeah, you can go first. Okay, my favorite board game is Innis. And it's just because I like it a lot and I win a lot. Do you want to give the pitch? Um, what is, okay, what would I, what is my pitch? I guess it's like hand management, sort of, worker placement, but it has a, a few different win conditions which is very interesting and makes my brain very happy. There's like three different win conditions for the game, so it's always like super cool to like stack a turn where it's like, okay, like what are the three different win conditions? How can I get so close to all of them so when someone stops me from going one direction, I can just pivot and win. It's my favorite. And it's, the art is gorgeous. Oh my God, it's, it's definitely a good recommend look looking at. it up. Mm -hmm. um, I-N-I-S, Innis. Um, I have a couple different favorites because I the flowchart thinking is really in my head for when I want to sit down and play board games. So I really like um, like Resistance and Avalon as the classic hidden identity games. They're not everybody's favorite, but they're like close to my heart for sitting down and playing one of those games with folks for an hour. Um, I am a big fan of Betrayal at House on the Hill as like a, you don't play a ton of board games. You've played Settlers of Catan a few times and we really want to get you um, that like gateway drug into playing more real board games. Um, so I really like Betrayal for that. Um, and my probably all time favorite game is Jungle Speed, um, which is a reaction speed game, like uh, Egyptian Rat Screw uh, or Speed or Set, but like very fast. And yeah, and you're mean. <laughs> Not on purpose. Yeah, but she'll hit you. Like don't play with Not her. Not on purpose. I cut my nails Not on I purpose, play. okay. Um, most people won't play with me because it. Um, yeah, don't. Because they, they don't wind up winning for a while. But it's, it's, it's like a, it's a pattern matching um, speed game, um, which I really like. Nice. I am the low key board gamer. I don't play a ton, but I have worked in the industry for a little while. And uh, I am a sucker for Splendor. I love the artwork. Love Anybody to touch can the play. It's you so can, You have so many things that you can just touch <laughs> and play with. And that is uh, just always a go to for me because, you know, that's something that. I could learn to play as someone who had no idea what I was doing, but then you can still enjoy it as you get better and better, and you can bring you know anybody in at, and that's that's a good go-to for me. Ooh, Splendor is a really good example of why it's important to have that good elevator pitch, though, because if you don't sell someone on Splendor immediately, it's really difficult to, it's like surprisingly difficult to explain for how mm -hmm. straightforward and easy the game is. Yeah. There's just like a lot of moving parts, especially if you aren't like well-versed in board games. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to be like, we're buying diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> you get to collect gems. And when you have gems, these, you can click, click them like click click chips, like a little dragon. <laughs> and there is, at least there used to be, I don't know if there still is or not, uh, but there used to be an app to play it on your own as well. So it doesn't have to just be with friends if you are someone who lives far away from your friends or you just wanna you know, mm -hmm. have something easy to play on the train or in a waiting room or whatever. I like that you can do both. Mm -hmm. Cool, anything else? Other questions? Please. Comments, concerns? concerns? Otherwise, we're gonna teach you how to play Skull and you're trapped <laughs> in the room. You're not allowed to leave until you learn yes. how to play Skull. That's not yes. <laughs> Okay, you want to scoot us back to the steps and then you can help me? Yeah. Okay, so if I was going to teach you guys how to play a skull, first I would do my little elevator pitch, which I gave earlier. This is basically, I'm pretty sure this was invented in a bar. It's just a bunch of coasters all in a box. Um, so the first thing I would do is I would get my friends distracted and involved. So I'd be like, hey guys, check out all these coasters and look at like how many cool colors there are. Can you pick your player color, please? Uh, and while they're doing that, I can flip through the rules if there's anything I don't remember, if it's been a while since I've thought about the game. Um, I can double check any corner cases if I'm confused. And I'm not, because this game's really easy. Okay, cool, and then I'll start explaining. So, the concept of this game is these little circular ones. These, this is your hand. You'll have four little coasters in it. Three are gonna look like these little yeah, the little flowers. Then you got one skull. 
So I've just explained what everyone has control over. I explained what everyone can like has in their hand and what they're going to do. Then I would give a brief uh, explanation of how gameplay is going to work. So I would do my turn. My turn is literally all I do is I pick one of these cards to play face down in front of me. Then we're going to go around in a circle, putting one card down face down in front of us. Drop a card down. Sweet. And then it is my turn again. I will now either choose to put a card face down in front of me or I will pick a number and that number corresponds to how many cards I can flip over without hitting a skull. So I would first flip over my card and then I would flip over however many cards. So if I say two, I would first flip over my card and then I would pick between one of yours and flip over that card. The way if I'm successful, woo, I win, I flip over, I get one point. Um, if I am unsuccessful, if I reveal one of the skulls, I die and I lose one of my cards and I go down to three. Um, and then if I am successful twice, the game's over and I've won the game. Cut and dry. Right? So I've just literally taught the whole game. That's it. You guys know how to play the skull now. It's very fun. But because it's kind of confusing, this would be the time that I would go through and do like a freebie round where whoever wins this round, whoever loses this round, I don't care, we're just gonna go back. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'll go first. Card in. I'll go again. I'm gonna say two. Two. Because I think I can flip over two cards without facing a skull. Awesome, and, this, I, and now I can explain things that I uh, like forgot to explain while I was teaching a second ago because I'm in front of people and I'm not a good public speaker. Whatever number you pick, you have to reveal all of yours first before you can go on to other people. Keep going. But also Meredith has a chance to bet, right? And you yes. also have a chance to bet. So do you think you could throw, do you think you could turn over three instead? Or do you want to see her turn over two? I want to see her turn over two. Ooh, I'll do three. I think I could do three. All right, I don't think I can you do four. You don't want to do four? No, okay. So I have to first reveal my two. Flower. Flower. I'm feeling confident, Meredith. Do it. Woo! There you go. One point. I will ask again. Guys, do we feel confident going forward playing this game for real? Yes. Cool. Yes. And now we play the game. There you go. Yep. You taught, I taught you guys a board game. Congratulations. Also, Skull's a nice board game because if you don't own the, don't tell the board game people that we said this, but if you don't <laughs> own the board game and you own any number of coasters um, that have different faces in the same backs, you can also play Skull in your house. You don't need the tile. You can just get coasters. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's why it was invented in a bar. Uh, it's a game called Skulls and Roses. Right? I also, there's games. three flowers, which could be three shots. I'm just saying. That's how it was invented. <laughs> I, I didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, I just thought about it. Yeah. OK. That's it. That's all I got. Usually, to, as a point of clarification, usually there are five people here, and there are a lot more people in the audience. Uh, so the question and answer portion usually takes a lot longer for this panel. So we usually try to reserve more time so that people can ask and have their questions answered. Um, but it's a weird year this it's year at MAGFest, so it is a it's weird been a weird year. time. Thank you. Thank you. I give up. We can just hang out. Yeah. Got the room for 22 minutes. How's everyone's minutes. MAGFest going? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds it. Awesome. I'm going to bury myself. Awesome. Question? You can't. No. I, that's <laughs> I can't. that's no. another game where you send out the rules to all your players. Because if they're going to play, they already know what they're getting into. And they're going to take the time to figure it out. So yeah, I, we've tried to set it up before, sent the rule book out to everyone who wanted to play and said, we're gonna play at this time. If you have not read the rule book, you're not playing with us. <laughs> also bring lunch and dinner, <laughs> and, dinner and, a and a sleeping bag. bag. <laughs> so that by the time we get to the end of it, you are in bed already because we're yes. having a slumber party. Yes. Because exactly. otherwise it's not gonna happen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Me and my family used to have Rail Baron weekends. And that was exactly it. That sounds, <laughs> sounds bad. OK, Ticket to Ride was not the first big train game. There were a lot of other ones, except uh. much like an old-timey train ride across the country, they took several days and were very boring. Uh. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so we used to play a lot of Rail Baron, which was a game that we would have to leave on the table for multiple days because it took very long. Oh, so you were always a nerd? Yeah, oh, okay, from okay, downtown. Okay. <laughs> Runs in the family. I see. I love it. We're just, we're done now. We're, yeah, that's unfortunately, all that's all we got. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. Enjoy the last of your magpies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna crawl into my head now. <laughs>